In this video, we're going to take a look at Beer's Law. Beer's Law is an equation or a law that basically tells us that the absorbance of light, the amount of light that's absorbed, is directly proportional to concentration. And if you know the amount of light absorbed, you can calculate the concentration by this law. You can see in one of two different ways, where this capital A is absorbance, it's something that's typically measured with a spectrophotometer. Um, this little a, or epsilon, sometimes it's written as either or, is just a constant. It's called the molar absorptivity constant, and it varies depending on what material you're using. So copper sulfate would have a different constant than nickel chloride and so on and so forth. So it depends on the substance you're using and how well it absorbs light. B is something called path length. And it is basically the distance that the light has to travel through the sample. So um, typically you're using a test tube that has a one centimeter path length, but it depends on the container that you're using. Though in an experiment, that's typically held constant for the duration of the experiment. And C stands for concentration. And here I can put typical units. So typically path length is centimeters. Concentration is um, might be molarity. And then your constant would have units of molarity per se uh, molarity sec, uh, centimeters both to the minus one so that they cancel out and give you this absorbance which is uh, a unitless number. Um, just always be aware of your units because if you're actually plugging in you need to make sure that they cancel appropriate, appropriately so always make sure when you're plugging into this equation that you plug in with units and pay attention to units. So this might look a little obscure so let's um, and again this is something you don't have to memorize because it's on your equation sheet but let's take a look at this simulation to kind of explore what some of these things mean in a little bit more depth. So um, here's just a drink mix, okay, so something like Kool-Aid. And um, here I'm going to pick a wavelength, and a preset wavelength is 508 nanometers. It's passing through this solution. And then there's this thing that detects the amount of light on the other side. And you can see that there's transmittance, which is how much light is transmitted through this solution. And that is um, basically going to range from, if I change the concentration, from about 100%, if it's colorless here, um, all the light would pass through, all the way down to close to 0% if all the light is absorbed by this solution. Instead of transmittance, you can um, set it to absorbance, which is this A in your Beer's Law. And A um, is actually just related to transmittance by being the negative log of it. Um, so the higher the concentration, as seen here, the higher the absorbance. And that's true as I see this simulation. I'm adjusting the concentration and it changes the absorbance. And it, notice that it relates to the color. So the less, the more dilute, um, the less moles of substance that I have in here, the less it's going to absorb the light and the more that's going to pass through and the less it will absorb. So um, color is very, is directly related to the concentration, which is directly related to the absorbance. If I change the substance, Okay, and you'll notice that the wavelength, the selected wavelength changes, and we'll talk about that in a minute um, from what they pick to pass through. Um, but if I change the substance, the absorbance changes even though everything else is held constant. So the path length, the amount of the, the, um, the distance the light passes through the sample is the same, um, the concentration is the same, but the amount absorbed changes because it's at the absorptivity constant is different for each substance. Um, let's go back to drink mix for a minute. Um, the other thing that you can change for the same concentration, you can change the path length. So if I make this a bigger path, B is going up in this equation, I would expect the absorbance to also go up, which is the case. Okay, now I have more particles of light that are in this path, essentially, that are going to be absorbing the light, and thus it's going to have a higher absorbance, or if I think of it in terms of transmittance, a lower transmittance. Um, so path length is directly related again to absorbance. Path length goes up, absorbance goes up. Concentration goes up, absorbance go up. I change the substance, I change the absorbance. Now you might be wondering um, why do these different substances, so here's nickel, why, do they, why are they selecting a different wavelength? So essentially you want to pick a wavelength that is going to be most absorbed by the sample. Um, and 
if I just go back to my PowerPoint for a minute, um, the color of light transmitted is actually the complementary to the color of light absorbed. And this isn't really something you have to memorize for the AP of any sort, um, but it does kind of have a little bit of a throwback to kindergarten when you learned about complementary colors, perhaps. Um, but so essentially, if you have something that... Um, uh, if something looks orange to you, um, if it appears orange to the human eye, it's actually because it's absorbing blue um, wavelength and thus it transmits the orange and lets you see the orange. Um, so if you kind of go back to, um, I go back over here just so you can see, um, that's why this color doesn't necessarily match the color of the solution. It's all based on what, what uh, wavelength is being most absorbed. Um, and how would you know that in an experiment? Do is you would keep everything else the same. You would keep the same substance. You would keep the same concentration. You would keep the same path length. But you would vary the, t the wavelength of light that's passed through. And if I do that, if you take a look at the absorbance as I change the wavelength, you can find okay where is your highest absorbance okay I find it to be about here and if I go back to my preset notice that's the wavelength essentially that they chose you want to pick the wavelength that is most absorbed by this sample um, so that you can run this experiment in the best way possible so if I kind of go back to here Okay, the following graph, so that would, uh, if you did this in an experiment, you would probably produce a graph, something like this. You would vary the wavelength, measure the absorbance, and you would see where the absorbance is the highest. And that's what you would set your spectrophotometer at and run the entire experiment at. Uh, we call this the um, lambda max. This is, we want to analyze samples using the wavelength with where most the light is absorbed, that's lambda max. So somewhere for this graph, um, for this particular substance, it's somewhere around 460 nanometers. Okay. Um, sometimes you might see a graph and there's two peaks, totally okay, you still pick the maximum. In this case, it would be around 460 as my lambda max. Okay, um, so how are you measuring this? Usually use what's called a spectrophotometer or spec20D. Um, and you can change the modes. You can either see transmittance or absorbance. Typically, we want to just be measuring the absorbance because that's what's in our equation. Um, you put your sample in a clean cuvette, or also it's called a test tube. You can call it either thing. Um, and just notice that the height of the liquid in the tube doesn't really matter. Um, all that really matters is the path length. Um, so if I go back to my experiment, the height is not really factored into the equation at all as long as the height is high enough so that um, the, scent, the light goes through the material and it's not low, um, too low, where the light doesn't go through the solution at all. So the height itself doesn't really, the exact height doesn't matter as long as it's high enough that it covers the sensor, it covers the, the, the distance between the light and the sensor. You would select the wavelength that you need, that we said the lambda max, and then you measure the amount of light absorbed. Um, and this way you can determine the concentration of any colored solution. So remember your transition metals typically produce colored solutions, things like manganate, uh, the uh, permanganate ion is a colored solution um, because if you have absorbance, you can calculate the concentration with Beer's law. Um, because other compounds in a solution may absorb the same wavelengths as the compound being analyzed, you typically want to compare the absorbance to a reference blank. We call it a blank. And ideally, the blank should contain everything found in the sample except the substance being analyzed. A lot of the times, if it's just one ion in water, your blank would be consisting of, uh, or one solute in water, your blank would just be the water. Steps that we use to calibrate the spectrophotometer to our blank. So first you would set the wavelengths to whatever you needed to for the experiment to be run at. Um, sometimes there's a filter switch at the bottom that you want to set to the appropriate wavelength range as well. And what you would do is first, without anything in it, you would turn this left knob and you would adjust the machine to 0% transmittance, teaching it that when, you know, when nothing's in it, um, there's no light passing through it, you want it to be at 0%. Then you would um, take a blank, you would do prepare, prepare your blank, you'd fill up a test tube or your cuvette with distilled water, and you'd put it into the machine, you make sure the door's closed so no other light comes in, and then you would adjust the machine to 100% transmittance to teach it that the, um, the blank, which again, it might be distilled water, or it might be distilled water and something else, depending what um, the thing that you're analyzing is, um, you're teaching that, okay, this is 100% transmittance um, when it passes when all this light is passing through this blank and now you have calibrated the machine you don't want to adjust any other um, 
these knobs any other time unless you're changing the wavelength. Anytime you change the wavelength, the, ma the machine needs to be recalibrated or re-zeroed. So proper use and sources of error. The AP loves to ask about sources of error. Your cuvette or test tube it should always be inspected for any scratches. It should be wiped free of fingerprints, um, and it should always be placed in the same orientation. Why? What effect would fingerprints or scratches have on the absorbance? Well, if I think about it, if there's fingerprints or scratches, some of that is going to either scatter or absorb the light. So less light is actually going to end up reaching the detector. Light that's not necessarily absorbed by the material or the substance we're studying, um, but it's scattered or absorbed by the fingerprints instead. So it will seem as if the solution has absorbed more light than it should, and the absorbance, thus the concentration if you were to calculate it, would be higher than it should be. Um, so that would essentially increase the absorbance reading. Um, what does Beer's Law tell us? What else can we do? We can get what's called a calibration curve. So what we can do is we can take a few solutions of known concentrations and we can measure the absorbance using the spectrophotometer. And we can create a plot that looks like this. Notice this is a direct relationship, which could be predicted from this. Uh, absorbance and concentration are directly proportional. I'm plotting absorbance versus concentration because concentration is my independent variable. Absorbance depends on that um, in this experiment. And then I can draw a best fit line, which is linear because there's this direct relationship. And now I have, it's called a calibration curve because I have this, this curve that basically shows me for any particular concentration, I can figure out the absorbance and vice versa for this substance. So um, you can either get a best fit line and plug into this y equals mx plus b equation, or you can literally just use the line, go over and drop down. So for instance, if the absorbance is found to be 0.275, what is the concentration in molarity? So all I'm doing is I'm going to, here's my absorbance, here's about 0.275, I go over, I drop down and I see that the concentration is about 0 0.008. Or if I wanted to, I could plug into this best fit line equation and get the same thing. So that's why it's called the calibration curve. Now for any unknown concentration for this substance, I can figure out the absorbance, or I, if I have the absorbance, I could figure out the concentration. Okay, so take a moment, try this example. Okay, absorbance is measured to be 0.3, here 0.3, drop down, I would get about 3, and notice here my units is micro um, molarity, uh, so just make sure that you are being aware of units. Proper rinsing techniques and solution preparation techniques should be ensured to make sure the molarity of the solutions are correct. If your molarities are incorrect, you're going to get a different um, observance reading than you would predict. Um, so for instance, if water droplets are left over in a cuvette before stock solution is transferred to it, what would be the effect on the measured absorbance? Would it be higher, lower, or the same? Well, if I had some water droplets, um, that would end up diluting the stock solution that I'm adding to that cuvette. So this would actually lower its concentration and result in a lower absorbance than I would expect for that data point. Okay, so again, the AP loves to ask about sources of error. So for, the, for instance here, this is a lower absorbance than I would predict based on the calibration curve. Let's think about sources of error. Um, water droplets diluting the solution. Okay, that could cause, um, as we just talked about, that could cause the absorbance to be lower. If I were to change away from the lambda max, okay, less, um, I think I'm measuring at lambda max, but actually I'm not, um, less light would overall be absorbed. This likely would have affected later, uh, latter data points to also be lower, so that's probably not the source of error for this one single data point. Okay, if I have a, a data point that's too high, what can cause that? Well, as we said before, fingerprints or scratches can absorb or scatter some light so that less is detected overall, and it seems as if the substance um, that I'm measuring is actually absorbing it, but something else. Or not aligning the cuvette the same way where there is, it is being passed through a point where there is more scratches or more um, smudges. Okay, um, you can actually plug into this and calculate one of the unknown variables at any point. So if I have the molar absorptivity constant, I have the path length, I have the concentration, I could calculate absorbance or vice versa. Just always be aware of units when you plug in. Um, the other thing you can do is you can set up with a proportion to solve something. So let's look at an example. Take a look at this example. Give it a shot. All right, so let's look at this. They gave me the molarity of a solution and the absorbance reading. 
and then I have a solution of containing the same substance, but I have an unknown molarity, and they give me the absorbance reading. What is the concentration of the solution? So if I go to Beer's law, okay, it looks something like this. Let's talk about what's being held constant in this example. So um, the molarity is changing. Okay, obviously, I have an unknown molarity and a molarity I know. Um, and the absorbance reading is going to change. But what's held constant? It's the same substance, so the absorptivity constant would be the same because it's copper, uh, copper 2 sulfate. The path length would likely be the same because I'm going to use the same cuvette, which would have the same distance. Okay, um, so really the only things that are changing are A and C. So I'm going to rearrange this equation so that A over C is equal to the path length times the absorptivity constant. But that's just a constant itself. Those things are staying constant in this experiment. So what I'm seeing is that the absorption over the concentration is always going to be equal to a constant as long as these two things are held constant. So I can actually make a proportion in this. So what I can actually say is that the absorbance at one data point over the concentration at that same data point is equal to the absorbance at a second data point over the concentration at that data point. So what I can do is I'm just making a proportion. And I can plug in. They told me that um, the, absor the absorbance is 0 0.820 for 0 0.34 molarity. And I have the other absorbance reading. So I can calculate my second concentration. It would have units of molarity if the other one's molarity. And this makes sense because these two things, absorbance and concentration, are directly proportional. Things to make sure of in the lab is, um, like here, there must be enough sample in the tube to make sure that the, um, the entire light path is covered. So a lot of times we made sure that the test tubes were filled up at least, you know, three quarters of the way or so like that. If you don't have enough solution in there, the light might be passing through an empty test tube rather than the solution. Um, you also want to make sure that you periodically, that you know that you've used a standard you want to make sure that you've calibrated your machine as we said before um, the solutions do not have to be saturated they can be unsaturated they can be concentrated or dilute um, it's you're you're figuring out the concentration based on the absorbance